ladies and gentlemen, please give me a huge eagle welcome to Brian McKay. Okay, it's working okay. Can you hear me in the back? All right, good. Well, thanks, Jeff and uh, Dr. Miller, for such a nice uh, welcome. And it is fun to be back on campus. Jeff actually graduated. He's an old guy. He graduated the year before me. I graduated in 82. Um, and you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. You come back and you think you've spent four years and you know the, the college. You used to you know, spend all your time on campus, downtown. Now I walk through campus and, you know, North Hall, it's not Wimberley Hall. Um, you know, we used to be called the Indians, now we're the Eagles. Um, Murphy Library is like twice the size it was when I was here. And we've got, you know, new facilities at Centennial Hall and the Rec Center. And we have a new student center here. So it's been, uh, it's been a, you know, 34 years of some pretty good progress. So, Really fun to come back and, and see the progress. But I looked at the uh, list of speakers that we've had here before, and uh, I say it's a little intimidating. It's a pretty impressive list of people that have come and spoken to this group before. And so I kind of hope I can, you know, uh, be able to uh, hit the high mark that they've set uh, in their uh, their time that they've been here. Um, so. Let's dive in. I want to first start off, and, and um, Jeff hit a lot of this. What we'll cover, uh, what I'm going to cover today is a little bit about me, and as I said, Jeff has already uh, given me some of that. Talk a little bit about where I currently work, which is Heartland Financial. Uh, and then I'm going to give you a little bit of what I see as we hire people, and have, you know, been, I've been hiring people uh, throughout my career. Um, some tips there. and. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, some things that I've learned or that I've been able to uh, kind of develop throughout my career that I think would be helpful for not just people coming out of college, but as you get further on in your career, things that can help you. Uh, and for those of you who might be already in a career, some things I think that uh, would be helpful as well. So my background, um, I came from a real small town up in uh, northwestern Wisconsin, uh, only 1,200 people. Uh, and what's interesting about that, and one of the things that I learned, when you're in a town of 1,200 people, everybody knows everything that everybody does. So if you do something wrong and you don't sort of fess up to it, you're going to get found out. So you learn uh, something I'll talk about later, you learn a lot about responsibility and being accountable, because you have to, because if you aren't, somebody else is going to make you accountable. Um, then I came to uh, UWL, uh, played some baseball in high school, wanted to play baseball, and thought accounting would be kind of fun as a, as a, uh, a career. Uh, I played on the JV squad one year here and then realized I wasn't going to make a lot of money playing baseball. so. I decided I better figure this accounting thing out because that's where I was hopefully going to earn some money. Um, so you know, I started focusing on studying harder, uh, getting to my uh, learn my accounting, my uh, my business uh, classes, and, and doing well there. Um, I got involved in the accounting club, uh, which is now I think you have Beta Alpha Psi here, uh, which I would strongly encourage you to get involved in that, or if you're in the finance area, get involved in your your finance club or whatever. I think it's important to get involved in things outside of the classroom. Um, I also got involved in uh, Delta Sigma Pi. Are there any Delta Sigs here tonight? Um, that was, you know, probably something that really helped my career a lot. I learned and met a lot of people that I still keep in touch with today uh, that I consider some of my best friends and met here uh, and, and their uh, brothers in Delta Sigma Pi. So, that, that was a really great experience. Um, and then when I graduated, uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, be able to join uh, Pete Marwick, which now is KPMG. Uh, and I will tell you, part of the reason, or probably the biggest reason that I was able to get a job there was because of, 
I used the professional services here in the, in the counseling area, uh, you know, did uh, a lot of mock interviews, we'll, we'll talk about that in a bit. But I also used my professors and leaned on them, and, and one of the professors, Dave Kepin, who's not here any longer, uh, I think he was probably solely responsible for me getting the job. He made calls for me, he called recruiters. Uh, at the time when I graduated, um, two of the big, at the time, big eight accounting firms were hiring up the Twin Cities. Um, and so it was, it was a very tough time to get a job. Uh, and I, I think the reason I got that job was because of Dave, who was one of the professors here. So, um, and then when I got to, to uh, KPMG, I, as quickly as I could, tried to take the CPA exam because I, I knew that, that was, there was value in having a CPA uh, certificate and license. Uh, yeah, I didn't want that to haunt me for years and years and years trying to get that. So I put as much effort as I could into getting that as quickly as I could. Uh, so for those of you who might be heading down the CPA path or if you're in finance to your CFA or if you are you know, end up being a broker or an insurance agent, uh, go and get certified, get your license, whatever, as quick as you can. Uh, it's, it's kind of that stamp or seal of approval um, that goes a long way in the business. Um, I also uh, tried to specialize, learn some additional things. So I uh, uh, was specialized in statistical audit um, delivery and, and the way that we uh, delivered that at KPMG. And then I uh, also taught some of their uh, internal courses for uh, our new accounts as we hired them. All that kind of helped give me some additional background that I wasn't just an auditor. Uh, when I decided to make my next move, I had some other things that I could uh, show and, and prove out that I had some value. From there, uh, I left uh, public accounting and uh, moved into the banking area. I uh, went to work for a pretty good sized uh, bank, uh, Bank One at the time it was about $75 million. It's now part of uh, J.P. Morgan, which is trillions of dollars. Uh, in size. Uh, I then spent years, and you can see on, on uh, the list, I had a couple of different uh, jobs during that time. I moved from Milwaukee to Green Bay to Columbus, Ohio, where I was with them. Um, then I got a chance to come back to Wisconsin uh, to work in at Associated Bank. Um, again, took a couple of different jobs. Stayed in, in Green Bay, but kind of moved around a bit. So what you'll know, and then, and then finally ended up at Department Financial about a little less than two years uh, earlier from here. Uh, but you'll notice that the banks got smaller and my responsibility went up. So what, was, what helped me was to learn as much as I could from those large organizations, be able to bring that to the next level of organization, which gave me some value to those, those institutions of what I could bring. Um, the, when I moved from, I took the internal audit manager job, uh, I was already an audit manager at KPMG, so that was kind of a lateral move, but it was a different discipline. Uh, then I moved out and I was a CFO of a small group of banks within the Wisconsin area, uh, and then I moved to Columbus uh, and went into a line of business, which is completely different from where you learned how to budget, forecast, a lot of different things in those, within those moves. Uh, then when I moved to Associated, really the job, the Director of Performance Measures, isn't that much different than the job that I had for Bank One uh, as a finance uh, director. Again, it's a lateral move, but it put me in a spot where now I was doing it for the whole bank, not just the part of the, of the bigger bank. Um, and then I was able to move into control and eventually uh, now I've got the CFO position title at Department Financial. Got me where I needed to be, and it gave me the disciplines uh, that I needed to learn throughout my career. It wasn't just a straight shot. It wasn't just accounting, accounting, accounting. So something to think about as you go through your career. Your paths aren't always straightforward. It's not always everything that, you know, your next move isn't always a promotion. Your next move isn't always going to be in the same town, necessarily. So, you can show flexibility and, and uh, you know, the want to take some different things and some different avenues. Uh, you'll find that that can be a very good way to grow your career. So that's the uh, 
that's kind of the professional side of, of my career. Um, the next part is the fun part, I think. It's the retirement. So this is what I'm looking forward to. Uh, the first thing is to do some traveling with my wife. And you'll see these are the places that I have yet to hit on my uh, bucket list. Um, so hopefully I'll be able to do those before I can. Um, I also uh, have a cabin up north. And uh, this is where uh, our family meets. Uh, my, my family is still up there. My parents are still up. This is in northwestern Wisconsin where I grew up. And uh, our three boys, uh, my oldest son is 26. He works for uh, uh, HR for wealth uh, waste management up in the Twin Cities. Uh, another son is 24. He's in Green Bay. He's a surgical tech. He works in the heart uh, surgery area, assisting uh, surgeries there. And my youngest son is uh, 22. He's at uw Milwaukee. He's still studying accounting and supply chain management. Happy to say he's got an internship for the summer at uh, Johnson Controls. So they're all doing well, and that's where we meet uh, in the summers and get together and have a great time. Um, next place is I don't want to spend my winters with the cabin. It's cold and everything freezes over. So I'd love to head to the beach, uh, have a place down south where when it's cold up here, I can be down there. You know. So that's what I hope. Uh, that's what I hope the time is like for me. This is uh, just a, a quick recap of some of the things I've done outside of work. Um, I think it's very important. We'll talk a little more about this, about being involved in the community and, and giving back and, uh, over the years, uh, including all the way when I was here at, at UWL and uh, participated in the volunteer income tax uh, program. I don't know if you still do that, but it was kind of we started to give back uh, to the community. All right, I think um, I'm going to switch gears now and start talking a little bit about where I work. And just, just a couple of things so you get some background. Two things about Heart and that, that really define us and define most companies is what's your mission, and what's your vision for the company. So, our mission, you see down at the bottom, I'm kind of looking at these upside down, uh, but our mission is really to excel in customer service. We're there to serve the customer. And then inspect those customers and the employees and the individuals and the shareholders that are part of our company. We believe if we do that, that everybody's going to uh, profit. Our mission, or our vision, I should say, is to be a group of banks. We've got 10 banks, and you see this in the middle. Um, and to grow the, the company to a size uh, that's probably 10 billion, now probably 10 billion plus. This is a little bit dated. We're, uh, we're a little over eight billion today. And we're heading ten and probably beyond. So that's why we exist. That's who we serve, and that's that's how we believe we can be successful. This is our footprint. Um, we've got, as I said, ten banks, uh, <clears throat> over a hundred offices, spread across the Midwest and the Western United States. Um, we get questions from investors a lot about. How did you end up in 10 states? You're this little littler bank from Iowa. How are you out in California and Phoenix and Denver? Well, my boss, who's the CEO, uh, probably 10 or 15 years ago, decided that if he wanted to grow the bank, he couldn't just stay in Iowa. There was only so much growth there. And so he started to move West. And the reason he moved west was because the growth dynamics are better than they are in the Midwest. The population is growing faster, income is growing faster, and there's less, a little bit less banking competition than what you find in the Midwest or the South or the East Coast. So his view was, let's go west. We can make more money. It'll maybe be a little bit easier than trying to battle it out in the East. The other thing we found out is we got diversification because of this. Uh, when we went through the Great Recession, our banks out in the West where you know, commercial real estate took a dive, we took some losses in those banks. But the banks in the Midwest and Iowa, because we weren't in the big metropolitan areas, we had record profits. The two offset, and we never had a year where we had a loss. 
not too many banks in the country could have gone through that great recession and not had a loss. So we're pretty proud of that, and we think that this strategy worked pretty well. Where are we today? Um, well, at the end of the year, we are 7.7 billion. Today, we're 8.2 billion. We just uh, closed an acquisition. We've been acquiring quite a few banks as we've, as we've grown. We just uh, did an acquisition, and we're up over 8 billion, about 8.2 billion. When I started in September 2013, we were 4.2 billion. So we've almost doubled in three years. The company is 35 years old. Uh, you can see some of the numbers there in the states we're in and the number of charters we have. Um, as I said, we never had a loss a year in the history of the company. We've had a quarter where we took a loss. We never had an annual full, full, full quarter loss. We doubled the company, except during recession times. We've doubled the company about every three to five, for five to seven years. Uh, we're certainly on pace to do that, at least in my first five years um, as we're going through here. We've had 35 years where we've paid a level or increase in dividend. And uh, as Jeff said, our market cap now is, is up almost 730 million. This was at the, at the end of the year. When I started, it was 400 million. Again, we've almost doubled the size and doubled our value in terms of our stock and how much is out there. And Um, this is just our income statement, and, and nothing really to point out here other than the numbers generally keep getting bigger and bigger, which is a good thing for the income statement. We did, uh, five years ago, we did $1.23. Last year, we did $2.83. So that's, that's pretty impressive uh, in, in five years. All right, that's, that's probably enough about me and, and some of the background the company worked for. Let's get to the stuff that it came for. Um, and uh, what I'm going to do next is talk about what I think employers uh, in the market are, are looking for. I kind of boil it down to three or four things. Other than grades, all employers are going to take your resume or you're, you're going to look, okay, do you have the base? Do you have grades that are, that are going to indicate that you've done all right in school? Get a too old, it's going to be a problem. But past that, what else are we looking for? We're looking for somebody to come in and relatively soon contribute to the company. How do you determine if somebody can contribute? You're going to look at what they've done. We're also going to want somebody who can communicate. That is probably the one skill, especially writing, that is, in my opinion, probably most lacking in the students that are coming out. Learn to write. It's so important. We'll talk a little more about those as we go through each of these. And then they're looking for somebody who's taken some time and demonstrated that they have some commitment to other things, commitment to other people, and have shown some caring and give back to the community. Uh, so let's let's first talk about contribution. How do we? How does a, an employer look for contribution other than grades? I think one of the things that they're looking for is what have you done in the teams that you've worked on, either in sports or in group projects or other things that you've done. Because a lot of businesses work through teams. They work through departments, which are groups of individuals who form teams that are team projects. Uh, so they're trying to assess how are you going to be as a team player. The other thing they're looking for is leadership quality. Um, what roles have you played on those teams? What have you done? What have your experiences been? How have you added value? And uh, how have you learned from difficult experiences on those teams? It's not going to be done well. How have you handled that? Those are the types of things that employers are going to ask you about. And finally, they're going to look for work experiences. Have you had any things that you've done either you know, prior to an internship or in an internship? What have you learned? What skills have you developed? What, have, what can you bring from those other experiences? Now, I'll tell you a story, and this is my son's story. He's still going to school at UW, or UW uh, Milwaukee. His grades aren't that good. Good meaning they're, they're just slightly below 3.0. Uh, 
but he has an internship. And the reason he has an internship is because he went out and got himself an on-campus internship in the, um, in the department uh, doing some projects around supply chain management. He was able to take those examples and when he went to interview with Johnson Controls, he had work experience. He could say, this is what I've done. I've learned this. This is, this is some of my work product that I've done. And they like that and they, you know, I'm sure that there were others who applied who probably had a great point average. But they hired him because of some of the experience he had. He had worked at Best Buy and could say, you know, some of the experience that he had is he actually managed uh, one of their sales areas. So he had some experience that he could put together with a grade point average that probably on its own might not have gotten the job. So it, it is important to put these together. Let's move to um, communication. Obviously there's written communication, right? And I'm talking about all forms of communication, even including emails. Uh, that you might send uh, to employers or uh, you know, afterwards, whatever. First thing is, proofread everything. If you think spell check works, um, it doesn't all the time. And example of that, this is seamless. My uh, CEO's nickname is Butch. Put that in and you don't watch spell check. The changes to him, uh, a name you probably wouldn't want to call your boss and send out in a, in a, a, an email. So don't trust the spell check. Second, don't use shortcuts at the mouth when you're texting somebody or sending an email. You've got to be able to write full sentences that pull together, uh, work together, and then form paragraphs. And, uh, I can't believe some of the, the letters that we get, um, or even my wife teaches in accounting, and she'll ask, you know, for papers and some of the stuff that comes back from some of these things. She'll read it to me. I can't figure out the point. So, really learn to write and write well uh, is very much a key. The resumes, uh, don't overdo it. Don't try to cram every last thing onto your resume. Give it some room so that certain things pop out that you think are the most important. Otherwise, the good stuff's going to get lost in all, all the things. That doesn't mean you shouldn't take credit for the good things you've done. But just be careful not to overcrowd things. Make it easy for somebody who's reading that to you know, pick out the three or five biggest things that are about you that you can put on this one. That first sub bullet point there about fluff. I had a boss of mine who was interviewing you, not a new recruit, but somebody who was, who was looking for a job that had some experience. On their resume, they put it, they were fluent in Spanish. They didn't know he was fluent in Spanish. He walked into the interview speaking Spanish, and the person who was there for the interview couldn't understand him and couldn't answer that. That was the interview. That wasn't even, this was for a treasury job. The ability to speak Spanish wasn't critical to the job. But it was on the resume. He picked up on it, challenged him on it, found out it was fluff. He didn't know. He wasn't fluent in Spanish. How do you think that credibility went for the rest of the things that might have been on that resume? Other things that he never said that he had done. And he was over at that point. So don't put things on there that you don't have a good backup story for or that. So you really can't back up in terms of your work. Um, focus on the things that you've done that we talked about, the contributions. You know, where have you added value? What's your experience? What things do you bring to the table? And make sure those pop out in your resume. Obviously, there's verbal communication as well. And I like this little thing here. In Latin, communis means you know, building, connections um, and common ground. That's what you're trying to do when you're in an interview or when you're in any discussion with people. You're trying to find that common link. Uh, when Jeff and I met tonight, first thing is we tried to figure out, okay, we were here about the same time. Who did we know? Turns out 
One of my best friends is also one of Jeff's best friends, but Jeff and I really didn't know each other. That's the common link, and that started the conversation. So you're trying to find, it's not always that easy when you're going into an interview with somebody that you don't know, uh, but you're trying to find those common links with someone. So here are just some things about that verbal communication when you're in an interview. Speak clearly. Don't use slang. Don't, don't um, 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 this or that. Or, uh, you don't want all that, like our verbal diarrhea. Work on that. Learn how to speak. And if you need to slow down or pause, pauses are fine. Um, but you need to be clear. You need to be articulate. You need to practice that speaking so you don't slide into I'm not my friends having beer and don't uh, shake the interview's name and say, I see what you're doing. That will. Um, when you're in your interview, I think one of the things that's really important is that you listen. Listen to the questions being asked before you just jump to what I'm going to say. And slow down when you're talking to somebody in the interview. It's not a race. You're not, you're not trying to cram everything in. Learn to kind of get your pace and, and slow down. What you might think is very fast or very slow is really probably pretty fast because you're probably a little nervous. Um, so slow down and, and you'll be fine. And it's okay to pause when somebody asks you a question. In fact, sometimes I think that's that's actually good that you're being thoughtful. And if somebody asks you what is the most important thing in your life. You don't want to blurt like it's, it's always kind of prospect. Take a second, gather yourself, and then answer the question. And then I think you want to have questions already prepared. And again, going back to this building a common connection, one of the things that I think is effective and that I try to do is to ask questions that are kind of twist them to a personal um, view. So you know, if, if you want to know what it's like to work with comp a company there, you, you probably want to say, what's this company like? Why wouldn't you say, how do you like working for this company? What things about it do you think it is? Turns it around, it makes it personal, and you're asking for their opinion directly as opposed to sort of uh, a little bit cooler and a little more distant. So, I think working on questions, you can't, all, you can't phrase all of them that way, but I think to the extent that you can, Ask those questions and draw the other person in and find that common link. I think it'll be more effective. Okay, the last uh, part of this then is commitment and caring. So, community involvement. What things have you done outside of class or work? Have you um, been willing to give back uh, to the community? And if so, what did you do? What specifically did you do? I think that point about don't overdo it is also important. Uh, I've seen resumes that are so chock full of I was in 50 different, you know, 10 different, um, different things from high school all the way through college. <coughs> and uh, you know, my question is, what could you do that much? You just spread yourself so thin. How could you have an impact? And I think employers are looking for you know, general, you know, fewer but more impact. The ones that have the biggest impact, the ones that really you can have a good story for, are the ones you want to have on your resume. And obviously, the, the stuff that you've done more recent, it's more important than stuff that you've done in high school. Um, certainly, uh, being involved in social or um, professional groups is important. So, for the FSI, FCI, whatever groups you might be involved in. Again. Have you had any leadership roles? What have you done in those, in those areas? And then lastly, outside of that, where have you gone above and beyond? Where have you, you know, in a group, had to, had to do something that was kind of extraordinary or um, helped somebody that was above and beyond? Again, employers are looking for people who have a little bit of depth and not just book and, uh, and a few other things that are looking for people who have done other things. Thank <laughs> you.
These next two, you might laugh a little bit at. Might seem a little bit like, who doesn't know this? Be surprised uh, what happens in interviews and how people show up. And the first one is what I call professional presence. Um, if you want a job, you gotta dress the part. It's not just an adjunct of going to class. When you go to an interview, you look like you're, you're dressed for it. Um, that means polishing your shoes. If they're not looking good, polish your shoes. You don't normally have a beard, or if you're going, you know, if you're not sure, that's okay. Lose the beard for at least a while and get the job. You know where you're there. Um, I think when you're in the interviews, it's important to make eye contact. You want to stare somebody down, but you need to make eye contact. That's important. Um, you know, the, the old joke about how can you tell them? from an actuary. An actuary will look at issues and account for issues. You don't want that. Right? Eye contact. You're trying to build that rapport. You can't build the pool by taking it out. Um, and a firm handshake. I can't believe how many times the kind of the right fish or the right practice. I'm telling you, practice it. Because there are employers, I'm not one of those, but there are employers who will make a big decision on when they hire somebody at. You know, at least stick their hand out first and how firm is that image? Somebody in the background. So that's important. And finally, you've got to be prepared. A lot of this is just practice. Mock interviews, and I'll go back to my son. The, one, the other thing that we told him is, listen, if your grades aren't that good, you better be able to interview well. Practice, you better go and have somebody ask you the questions and work on how you respond to those questions. Get input, and uh, I would use your, your professors, and certainly I would use career services uh, to make sure that the resume looks good, that you're ready for those questions, and that you have some research on the company area. Why, why are you interested to do that? What do you know about the company that's interested to you? Use those as, as some of your questions and leave from your questions. So hopefully that will uh, you know, help you uh, as you go out and, and think about things other than just your grades and, and what else are you going to focus on, how else are you going to handle them. Vitally important because Grades will open the door, but how you interview is what's going to get you the job. And I think Jeff would probably agree with me. I've turned down a lot of pretty high GPAs uh, who I've interviewed because that's all they had. When I talked to them, it was very cold. There wasn't a lot of depth outside of class. There wasn't a lot of other things. So, you know, other things are important besides. Okay, I want to shift gears. Uh, I'm going to go through. This is this is kind of. And these are not in necessarily any particular order. But I've got 10, 10 things I'd like to share that I think will help you, maybe even as a student, but certainly once you get into uh, your career, that if, if you work on these 10 things, you don't have to be great at all 10. One, two, or three of them being really good would be really uh, a benefit to you. But I think there's a lot of these that you can work on and uh, that if you just can get them in the top of your mind and be thinking about it as you go about your, your professional career, you'll be better off. So the first thing uh, is, and, and I think almost every successful person, whether it's in business or in uh, professional sports or you name it, almost always have goals. Okay? But, Golfer always has a goal to break his best and win certain tournaments. Or, you know, um, business people have goals for their, their business to, to get over a certain return on equity or to get over a certain uh, share, whatever that might be. And those that have really you know, deep and good careers and go a long ways also have multiple levels of goals, not just a couple. 
presence for us. Um, uh, they have high goals first. Um, they aim really high and they keep resetting the bar as they achieve. They don't just say, okay, I, I did my personal best um, and that's where I'm gonna stop. It's like, okay, I achieved that. Now how much further can we go? So they keep reassessing those and they have both short and long-term goals. So if they know where they're going five years from now, and then your goal for this year is how far do I need to be on that goal so that I can get in five years where I want to be. And you keep moving those out and keep them um, they, have, they have goals that are professional goals. So, where do you want to go with your career? What level are you trying to attain? What sort of achievements would you like to have? You know, maybe that's passing the CPA exam. Maybe it's getting to a director level or becoming a CFO or whatever that might be. Uh, sometimes it's um, you know, financial goals that go along with that. It might be a level of income that you're trying to get to, might be net worth, or it might be things that you want. You know, I want to be able to purchase a house. Uh, I want to be debt free. Other things that you're aiming for. Um, but professional, financial, and then personal goals. This is what I call having the bucket list. I'd like to see this, I'd like to do that, I'd like to attain this skill. Maybe it's downhill skiing if you're not down, downhill ski or whatever it might be. I think those those three areas, having goals and then reviewing those and revising them as you go. Uh, I have a book, I didn't bring it with, but I'll give you a list of some of the things that I had in, in this book. I keep crossing stuff out that I that I've accomplished. Actually, I put a check by the things I've accomplished. I cross a few out, either because I switched jobs and that's not applicable anymore, or it's just, you know, I thought that was a good idea. It's something I really wanted to do when I thought about it five years ago, and now I'm five years older, and maybe that's not what I want to do. Um, but you keep revising and, and reviewing those uh, and, and looking at them so you know where you're going and you know what you're, what you're trying to achieve. And then go through them periodically and see what you've accomplished. It's, it's kind of interesting. I hadn't done this for a while until I sat down to kind of put this together. Um, but some of the things that were on my list, and, and this list goes back to, uh, in the, I, I think I started doing this really in earnest around 2000. So one of the things that I had on the list was become CFO at that time, of Associated Bank, but I became a CFO at Hartman Financial. So I accomplished that, that goal. Uh, I wanted to own a cottage up in northwestern Wisconsin. I now own a cabin up in northwestern Wisconsin. Uh, I had on there that I wanted to go see Israel. About three years ago, um, my wife and I went to Israel. Incredible trip. One, and this is not to brag, but in 2003, I wrote down that I wanted to have a net worth of a million dollars. Check on that one today. So I worked on hard to do that, and now that number's a lot higher. Keep more, I keep setting that goal. So, and you guys, you know, sitting out there might think, wow, that's really high. Money. But I've been working with this for 30, almost 35 years, so uh, you can do that too. But, but, you, but you have to start with goals that put you on that path. Um, I have a list of things that I haven't achieved yet that are still on that list. One of those is to have a 10 or less golf handicap. Um, I haven't practiced enough, and that may never happen, but that's still my goal. Uh, I have on there to own property in Florida, so that beach picture is a place to go uh, when, I, when I go to the beach. Uh, get all my kids through college. I've got two, I'm working on the third, it's almost done. Uh, we'll see, but I think, I think I'm going to be able to check that one off as well. Uh, to be totally debt free. I'm not quite there yet. If I really wanted to, I could, but you know, that, that's still a goal um, that I have. Uh, retire by age 55. Six right now, so I probably didn't do so well on that particular goal. But you have to adjust. And the reason that that adjusted is when I, was, when I wrote that goal, um, I was a lot younger. But also, I worked at a company that early retirement was age 55, and that was you know, the period when I thought that would be a good time for me to retire. 
early retirement where I am now is 62, so this goal now is 62. Um, and then get my weight under 190. That one, that's more. <laughs> Probably not until after I retire and have time to work on both my handicap and my weight. Maybe when I get those on. Uh, the next thing is, and I think this is important throughout wherever you are, learn to listen. You can get a lot by listening before you start asking questions, before you jump in and interrupt. Uh, it's a great book. You can see that for a while, and I apologize that, uh, to show up a little bit. It's by John Maxwell, and it's called Good Leaders Ask Great Questions. And I would recommend that book to you guys to read. It's got really good, a lot of good practical things, especially once you get out and start working and you see a lot about teamwork, how do, how do you communicate, you know, how do you, uh, how do you set some goals, and, and it's, it's just got a, a really good, um, good advice in it. So, some of the things that go along with that, I think listening is what leads to learning. I think you learn a lot more and I learn a lot more from my team when I listen to them first. One, tells them I care about what it is that they're saying. Taking the time to listen. Um, I get all different points of view. And lots of times, as three or four people listen, I don't even have to ask the next question because they hear somebody say something and that triggers them. And I get to listen to all that before I jump in and then ask the question which we'll talk about in a minute. The other thing I try really hard not to do is to interrupt. And I truly believe this, that when you interrupt, it means, hey, what I have to say is more important than what you have to say. That's not how you want to treat other people on your team. And certainly as legal, that's not how you want to treat people who look for you or who you're looking for contributions from. So after you've listened, then it's about asking questions. If you ask questions the right way, the right tone and the right type of questions, it pulls people together. Those who maybe haven't, as you've been listening, been part of the conversation, you can in and question. Well, what do you think about that? What's your view on that? I haven't heard from you yet. Can you add something to what we're talking about? It helps you get some deeper understanding because you ask that next question. Hey, I heard this, but I think you might have that. Is that am I right? You get more depth to it. And finally, all of that with listening and asking those questions, you get better decisions from your team and you do it together. It's not I'll tell you what you do, I'm not listening to that. Nobody wants to work. All right, number three. This is probably for me one of the biggest things, and it's probably because of my profession and a few other things. People can't work for me. I don't think that they have integrity and they're not accountable. And that's a professional thing, and we'll talk about in a lot of these other parts of the slide why I think that's important. Um, integrity, uh, and there's lots of different angles on integrity, but to me, have to follow the rules. Accounting has rules, businesses have rules, there are codes of ethics, there are various things in the working place that people aren't going to follow. And if I can't trust you to follow them, what else can I trust about them? So, um, and, and if there are rules and there are things that businesses have taken the time to put down, and put them down so people can use them. So it's very important. Um, honesty, trustworthiness, truthfulness, all of those are extremely important uh, to me. Uh, as, otherwise, I have to check everything that somebody has. I trust me to do. I don't have time to do that. I would get nothing done if I had to recheck everything that, that people who look to me do because I don't trust them. That's the case, then they have to go, and I've got to get somebody else so I can do that at once. Accountability goes to kind of that first uh, bullet point there. You have to follow through on your commitments. Make a commitment, 
meet this deadline and get this done, you really need to follow through on that. You can't make a commitment and then that goes to school and make a commitment to your team that you've got a team project. Don't follow through on that, what happens to the rest of the team? Uh, and then I need people who tell me the truth, not just what they think I want to hear. Because if there is something going on and, and I don't see it, people don't tell me, I can't help them with it, and it's going to fester and get worse. And as we we'll talk about in a minute, I signed a piece of paper, a pretty important piece of paper, it goes to the SEC, the recorder that says our numbers are correct. Something's going on and somebody doesn't tell me. I'm on the line. They're not. And so, well, they've got to tell me the truth. Whether I want to hear it or not, whether I like to hear it or not, uh, I've got to be open and, and hear them. And then people need to take responsibility when things go astray. I see, and I think we see a lot of this, lots of evidences in our society today, it's always somebody else's fault. Somebody else messed it up. It can't be my fault. I'm not taking it. Well, who wants to be around people who are whining and reflecting on that? I have this that sits on my desk. It says, the one who complains about the way the ball bounces is likely the one who dropped it. That sits on my desk to remind me that don't be a whiner. Take responsibility. Try to go fix it. Don't try to figure out who messed it up. But just go get the fix. So why is all this so important? I'll give you one hint. Um, I have this taped to the back of my credenza. This was given to me by the CFO that I worked for up in Green Bay. He said, here's your get out of jail free card. You get to use it once. And it's not good outside the company. So if the SEC comes after us and after me, I don't think that get out of jail card is going to work. Um, so this is all very important because I'm the one who's signing off on, on all of our SEC documents. Uh, I'm the one who's going to be hauled into court if things are wrong. Um, the other thing about all this is once you lose your integrity with somebody or you're not accountable, it's very hard to get it back. You don't get a lot of second chances when you don't, when you're not truthful, when you're not following the rules. Uh, so it's important to do this all the time. You can't do this some of the time. You, you can't do this part way. And I learned that when I was an, an, an auditor. One of my clients was a savings and loan uh, in uh, North Western Iowa. The CFO there called up one day and he said, I've had enough of this. I've got a CEO and a uh, president who have been stealing money from the company. They've been turning in their own personal electric bills and having the company pay for them. Appreciate the car down to zero and then they would buy it for zero and basically they would, um, when they repossessed a the house, the house needed some work, they'd buy carpet. Well, they'd buy carpet for their own house and carpet for their own house and charge for the company. All that was basically stealing from the company. So he said, I've had enough of it, this has got to stop. But the other thing he had in his mind was, if those two guys get canned, I'm going to become the president. What he forgot to figure out is, he had done just a little bit the first year or two. He turned in a couple of his electric bills and had to come in. So we had to come in and do an audit. The regulators wanted us to come in and do an audit and found that. All three of them, including the CFO, ended up in jail and were disbarred from the blew the whistle on himself because he thought, well, I've just done this. Well, you can't do just a little bit. So, that, that's why this one is, is so important to me. Uh, and I've seen it uh, where it's very important. All right, teamwork. We talked a little bit about teamwork and why it's so important. Um, there's lots of different definitions of teamwork. But I'll tell you one that I kind of think of this in reverse. Uh, it's not, teamwork is not what everybody's doing what I tell them to do without the plan. That's not what teamwork is. 
be great if that works, but that's not the um, team. So if you're a member of the team, I think there's some things that, that everybody needs to understand, and that is this concept of shared faith. Everybody's in it together. Everybody on that team is going to win or lose based on how the team does. Everybody should have the ability to have input into decisions, but once that decision is made, then everybody needs to get behind that decision and make it the best uh, that it can be. And that's by contributing whatever you can, not holding back, but also not overstepping your bounds on what other people should be doing uh, in that group. So, so play your role. If you're the leader, this goes back to listening. You need to listen to the people on the group. In the group. So, um, and I think that quote, when, when team members don't think that the leader's listening, they're going to shut down. They're going to look for somebody to listen. Both with their feet or both with the, I'm not going not to help. And I think that last part is really key to leadership. When things go well, you share, share all of that good stuff that the team did. When things go bad, you don't point the finger, you, you shoulder the blame and say, you know, I was a leader of this, it didn't go well. Okay. Um, it's not. That's a hard role to play, but I think it's important. I've had project managers who will run projects, they'll, they'll basically do the wrong definition. You do this, you do this, you do this, and we're going to meet the timeline, and we'll be done, and Projects get done right because they know what needs to be done and maybe they're the smartest on the team. But every time that happened, I had a, I mean, it was Heather. Every time that happened, when she ran a project, the project got done on time, met all the objectives, and I had five people in my office complaining about how that was the worst project they ever been on and how bad Heather was. It's not a successful project in my book because I spent all that time kind of for some people back, you know, that, that they should be uh, uh, okay with this. I spent two years working with Heather. She was, she was probably the smartest person in our department. Two years of sending her to training and talking her through, getting her to, to really listen and take the time to lead people to the right answers and have them have input. The projects got done, maybe a little bit later, maybe it took a little bit longer. But there was nobody in my office complaining about how the projects went, and it was just so much better. So it's it's worth the time, it's worth the effort. And how you work on teams is going to be very important in how you're viewed in your company, because in most companies, teamwork is very important. Okay. For five, being decisive and taking reasonable risks. Anybody know what this is? Kind of literally a burning platform. So again, you guys probably think that I was jumping off. I have this, I got this years and years and years ago. It's a burning platform. Now if you were on that, and, and there is a story behind this, there were people on this platform and, and it started on fire. If you were on that platform, you don't have days to think about, what are you going to do? Two choices, right? Jump. Or stay. Maybe the third is, I don't know, so you don't know. For those that decided to jump, especially if they jumped early and put far enough away, they, a lot of those people survived. They could swim and do swimming. Everyone stayed on that platform, but I'm just involved with the thing. So the story is you have to you have to take some risks and you have to be decisive. If you procrastinate and you're your platform's on fire, you're going to go down with the platform. So, yeah, I think, you know, a lot of leaders, you know, there's some great quotes. I think, again, I got this from the, the John Maxwell book that I, I quoted before. Um, you know, progress always takes some risk. Almost anything you're going to do that's going to be moving forward, it's going to take some level. Leaders who decline to make decisions create insecurity among their followers and undermine their leadership. That's pretty clear. 
And this last one, I think, is, is probably the most important one, and that is not all of your decisions are going to be correct. It's nobody's perfect. But if you don't start making some decisions and trying it on and getting comfortable with it, how are you ever going to get better? And maybe by the end, you'll start to be a better leader and make better decisions. And decisions will let the team move forward, will let the company move forward, will let you move forward. Not making decisions, hunkering down, you need to worry about what might happen, not taking the risk, it's going to be paralysis, and you know, nobody wants to be in a company or a team that's going to be paralyzed. All right, we'll pick up speed here, we'll get close to the end. Um, surround yourself with a good network of people. I thought of talk uh, at dinner tonight about networks and people and who do you know. Uh, I have a group, um, folks that I mentioned, that we're in Delta Sigma Pi together here. We, every year, for the last 20 years, as a group of 12 of us, sometimes there's a couple fewer, sometimes a couple more, but generally around 12, but every year go down to four and play golf in the for 20 years. So about 14 years after we all graduated, we started to be able to do this. Um, and we just have the greatest time. And it's all, this group of 12 guys, we have lots in common. We are successful, uh, we share the same, uh, interest in integrity, you know, and we share the same interests in sports, lots of things that hold us together. And we learn a lot from each other while we're down there. We talk about what's going on in each in of our careers and when are you going to retire, how much, you know, how much money do you think you need before you retire, and all this great discussion. Um, we just have a great time. Think as you go through your career, and I've gone, you know, lots of different businesses that I've worked in different companies. And in each company, I have probably three to five, sometimes it's less, sometimes it's more, people that I've kept in contact with that I felt were people that can kind of hit the four or five things that I look for and people I want to stay in contact with. And that is somebody who has high integrity, somebody who has a strong commitment to others, similar interests, positive attitude, and they're successful. Because I never know when I get kind of stuck and need some advice. Um, you know, one of the guys I keep in contact with, he's now a consultant. And he, uh, he works with CFOs at you know, community banks. I would call him two or three times if he's worrying about something and I was thinking to make sure I wasn't just totally. Yeah, you know, it's, it's great. We get together for lunch. Um, but you have to make the effort to identify those folks and then keep in touch. Can't wait for them to keep in touch with you or pretty soon the user will buy them. Find them or you want to talk to them enough from that connection. Next thing is let the time to become a professional and stay a professional. Books, seminars, additional certifications, all those things help you to continue to become more and more valuable more and more uh, in touch with whatever your profession is. That last comment there about those who refuse to grow up professionally and you stay current are really declining because the world is moving forward. You don't keep up, you need to pass by. It's not easy when you get in your job and you're working 40, 45, 50 hours a week, you've got a family, you've got other commitments find that time to stay current. But if you don't, you're going to get left behind in most professions. Um, that's not a good place to be for you. Uh, number eight, uh, we talked a lot about this. Find time for charity and community. Uh, I think good leaders learn how to serve and get back to their community. And I think that's uh, you know, just one of the things that do that and find a big Paybacks and dividends will come back to you. Number nine, um, again, one that's much easier said than done, and that's balancing your work and your family life. Some of you coming out of college, that won't be a big deal. You don't have a family partner. Eventually, at some point, most of you will have to kind of deal with this. And I think it really takes commitment on your, your part as well as your family's part. Takes communication and flexibility. Um, I saw this. My, my dad used to uh, 
bring work home and I would look up and get a drink of water at 10 o'clock and think he'd be working at the uh, kitchen table. But he never missed any of my baseball games. He was always there for uh, you know, Cub Scouts, whatever it might have been. He made that time and then he and everybody else went and went to bed, went to whatever, and he did his work. He figured out how to make that work. So there are ways to do that. It just takes effort, um, but you can't neglect your family. Um, their importance in terms of how your whole professional life goes. That's the support. And, uh, if that issue's going on at home, it's going to affect how you are at home. So. Last thing is, and it's a little bit funny in this sort of thing, talk, but it's important that you manage your finances well. So see integrity. If you're in banking, if you're an accountant, if you're an investment advisor, things that a lot of business folks end up doing, talking to other people about finances. If you're financing it on this, why can't you tell somebody else how to manage their finances? So that's one thing. Um, interestingly, I found a couple of the, uh, the statistics. This was just in a recent article, it was just last week. Um, poor finances affect 60% of younger millennial workers. Now, uh, I'll surmise why that might be. Student debts. So that's one of the things you guys are going to have to try to figure out how am I going to get through that and, and manage your finances as well. It's probably not going to be real easy. But even higher earning professionals, over 100,000 reported financial stress. So it's not just low income on the workers. People that even make a fair amount of money can, can have overlived or you know, made bad investments, whatever it was. So that to me is important. And I think, you know, I caught. If you're at work and you're worried about I'm going to pay my bills, how am I going to do this or that, you're not going to be focusing on your job. You're going to be thinking about other things. So again, kind of family, good finances I think are important. And the most important thing you can do is as soon as you can, if your company has a 401k, you at least putting in the, as much up to the match because that's free money. Companies will match you three, five percent, whatever it is, of, of your of salary if you will contribute that. If you don't, you lose out on an extra three or five percent because it won't be contributed if you don't contribute. So figure out a way to do that. And um, I think you know, if you can spend the time and really work through having a budget and stick to it, finance and accounting person budgets, if you stick to them or to them. Can help you get through this. And then once you get on the other side and, and, and you've done that for a while, uh, you'll be fine. But it, you, have to, you can't just ignore it because once that snowball gets going down the hill and you get a little behind, it's hard to fix it. So don't neglect that. All right, so the very end, have fun and enjoy the ride. This is. Uh, my group, uh, when I was with Bank One, um, we went and, and did ra river rafting as one of our um, team building exercises. And I don't know if everybody's enjoying the ride right here. I think the, the lady that's sitting right in front of me, is Iris, I think she was a little, a little stressed out uh, doing this. But uh, the guy who's in the front right, he's having a great time. He's now a CEO at a bank out in California. So he's, he's had fun and enjoyed the ride. So, um, that's really, uh, that's it. That's what I have for you.